Good morning. Uh, this is Jose Romero. Uh, I'm the chair of the uh, ACIP. Welcome to the second day of our scheduled February meeting. Um, I hope you've all had a restful afternoon and evening. Um, we'll start by taking a uh, roll from the uh, voting members just to make sure we're all on the line. So um, I will start with myself, uh, Jose Romero. Um, I'm present. Uh, Dr. Alt, are you here? I am here. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Yes, and I have no complex if you want us to tell you that, too. <laughs> Dr. Bat, uh, sorry, Ms. Bata. Good morning, I'm here. Dr. Bell. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Dr. Bernstein. Good morning, I'm present. <laughs> Dr. Chen. Chen, here. Dr. Daly. Daly, here. Dr. Fry. Fry, here. Dr. Cotton. Present, Camille Cotton. Dr. Lee. Morning, Grace Lee here. Dr. Long. Long here. Ms. McNally. Good morning, McNally present. Dr. Paling. Good morning, Paling present. Dr. Sanchez. Pablo Sanchez present. Dr. Talbot. Talbot, present. Welcome all, um, and uh, thank you for being here. Um, we will now proceed to agency updates, and I'll ask uh, Dr. Messonnier to please give a CDC update, please. Great. Thank you, and um, uh, thank you, everyone, for all the hard work. I, um, I'm going to just go over a few points today of things that I don't think are going to be extensively covered at any point during either um, this week's ACIP or the ACIP on um, Sunday and Monday. So um, one thing I want to um, continue to bring to your attention is our concern about childhood immunization rates. Provider ordering for fiscal year 20 and 2021 to date has decreased 14.4% compared to that for fiscal year 2019. Um, even though there have been um, efforts to try to catch kids up, we're not catching every child. And, you know, obviously very concerning, especially around as we also have conversations about kids returning to school. And of course, kids that are behind now are going to have more difficulty catching up. So I really um, hope that you'll join me in an additional call to action regarding the need to catch up on routine childhood immunization that were missed. Um, several partners, including CMS and AAP, um, joined us in a call to action in October around this issue. But we really think we need to, again, emphasize and bring visibility to the, to the issue before, the, before um, and as kids start returning to school. Um, the next thing I, I want to point out is that, you know, as a, as a public health enterprise, we all last summer raised the concern and alarm about the potential for a joint flu and COVID um, escalation this fall. And therefore, there was a lot of emphasis around trying to ensure that we had sufficient supplies of flu vaccine so that um, everyone would have the opportunity to get vaccinated. Um, it, it's, it's good news that, in fact, we didn't have a bad flu season, and I think we'll hear about that a little later on today. But we were also successful in distributing a lot of flu vaccine. As of February 12th, 193.7 million doses of flu vaccine have been distributed in the U.S. That is the highest numbers of doses distributed in the U.S. in a single season. I think many of you would agree that this is a momentum that we want to keep going. And regardless of whether it was a bad flu season last year, there is another potential this year for escalation of flu, especially, again, as um, folks return to normal and there is less social distancing and kids return to school. And so we're really hoping to be able to continue to build on the success of distribution last year and also the messaging to people about why it's important for everyone to get a, a flu vaccine. 
Last, um, I just want to note that um, yesterday, on Wednesday, we concluded the National Forum on COVID-19 Vaccines. There were 13,000 people who registered for this forum um, across every state and um, territory. The forum was intended to advance the goals of the national strategy and COVID-19 response and pandemic preparedness, ensure information was exchanged about innovative vaccine strategies and promising practices, use data to drive vaccine implementation in communities and provide support to states and jurisdictions seeking to administer vaccine. Over the course of three days, 108 expert speakers were engaged. Um, I, I was able to participate in some and listen to other of the plenaries and the panels. It was really a great exchange of information and um, great to hear stories of how innovative um, jurisdictions and partners have been in promoting and ensuring access to COVID-19 vaccines. And so if you weren't able to attend, for example, those of you who spent yesterday at the ACIP meeting, there's lots of online information already that results from that forum, but also the recordings of the plenary sessions will be available online. And I really hope that we also can take the momentum of this forum to continue to um, move forward with achieving um, high rates of COVID-19 vaccination across every corner of every community in the U.S. with equity really a, a driving value. Thank you, Dr. Romero. Back over to you. Thank you, Dr. Messonnier. So now we'll hear from um, other uh, agencies, uh, uh, Centers for Medicaid Care, Medicaid Services, please. Good morning. This is Mary Beth Hans from the um, the Center for Medicaid and CHIP Services within CMS, um, and I'm assuming you all can hear me. Um, I have a couple of updates. Um, the first is around COVID, um, COVID vaccine. As you know, CMS with CDC has hosted a series of fireside chats on vaccine safety that were aimed at nursing home staff. Um, those fireside chats started in December. Um, Building on the comment that Dr. Messonnier just said about um, the reduction in pediatric vaccine, we had Dr. Amanda Cohn and Dr. Melinda Wharton speak to the Medicaid agencies in late January on both um, COVID-19 uh, vaccinations, focusing on um, vaccine safety, hesitancy, and equity. And then Dr. Wharton talked about the reduction in pediatric vaccine rates and her call to action. And we um, look forward to working with CDC in the future to address this, um, these reductions in pediatric vaccines. Um, we also have developed a number of toolkits around um, COVID-19 and COVID-19 vaccinations that are available at cmsgov covid that's C-O-V-I-D-B-A-X, and we will continue to update that material. So, um, feel free to check that website regularly as we update that material. Those are my updates. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Food and Drug Administration. Hi, good morning. This is Dorn Fink with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration Office of Vaccines. Tomorrow, FDA will convene its Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee to discuss a request for emergency use authorization for Janssen's COVID-19 vaccine. This is an adenovirus 26 replication deficient vectored vaccine that is to be administered as a single dose regimen and the request is for emergency use authorization in individuals 18 years of age and older. Additionally, uh, earlier this week, FDA released updated guidance on emergency use authorization of vaccines to prevent COVID-19 uh, to outline uh, data that could support uh, emergency use authorization of modified vaccines uh, to address emerging variants of SARS-CoV-2. Finally, in non-COVID related news, uh, in December of 2020, FDA approved uh, Vaxcora live oral cholera vaccine for use in pediatric age individuals 2 
through 17 years of age. And we'll be hearing more about the data that supported uh, that approval later today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Health Resources and Services Administration. Good morning. This is Mayor Rubin from the Division of Injury Compensation Program. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to provide this update. The National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program, VICP, continues to process an increased number of claims. In fiscal year 2020, petitioners filed 1,191 claims with the program, with 186.9 million was awarded to petitioners and 31 million was awarded to pay attorneys' fees and costs. In fiscal year 2021, as of February 1, Petitioners filed 1,226 claims with the program and nearly 82 million was awarded to petitioners, including paying their attorney's fees and costs. In addition, as of February 8, 2021, HRSA had a backlog of 1,137 claims alleging vaccine injury awaiting review. The National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program revisions to the vaccine injury table delay of effective date was posted in the Federal Register. As of February 22, 2021, the effective date of the January 21 final rule published in the Federal Register at 86 FR 6249 is delayed for 60 days from February 22 to April 23, 2021. As of February 1, the Countermeasures Injury Compensation Program, CICP, has received 580, I mean 508 claims. Of the 508 filings, 450 were ineligible for compensation and 19 cases are in medical review process. The CICP determined 39 claims were eligible for compensation, totaling 6 million. The Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services issued a Marburg virus or Marburg disease declaration effective November 25, 2020. The declaration provides liability immunity for the manufacturer, testing, development, distribution, administration, and use of covered countermeasures. In addition, the declaration permits individuals seriously, covered, seriously injured by covered countermeasures to file a claim with the CICP. Thank you for um, allowing me to provide the update. Thank you very much for your update. Uh, next, Indian Health Services, please. Good morning. Regarding uh, COVID-19 vaccination efforts, IHS established a COVID vaccine task force in September of 2020 to finalize agency-wide planning for COVID vaccine allocation, distribution, and administration within IHS, tribal, and urban Indian health facilities who are receiving vaccine from the IHS. The IHS Vaccine Task Force areas of focus include distribution allocation, vaccine prioritization, vaccine administration, communication, data management, and safety and monitoring. The Indian Health Service continues efforts internally and collaboratively with CDC and HHS to track COVID-19 vaccine distribution, administration, and safety data. Vaccine administration and coverage data currently reported by the CDC COVID data tracker as of February 24th indicates 826,090 COVID-19 vaccine doses were delivered to IHS with 468,627 doses administered for an overall administration rate of 56.7%. Regarding the importance of childhood immunization coverage, we have been tracking up-to-date childhood immunization coverage for two-year-olds during the pandemic. Initially, we saw that most IHS areas maintained their childhood immunization coverage even as other national studies documented decreases in vaccines ordered through the VSC program and decreases in vaccines administered. Prior to the onset of COVID-19, the national up-to-date coverage for two-year-olds was 64.7%. Coverage fell to 58.5% in the most recent quarter, ending 12:31. The total number of children who were two years old each quarter reported into the system decreased, indicating 27% fewer two-year-olds were registered in our clinics during this period. For the denominator, the decrease is 34% for 3,664 fewer two-year-old children being fully vaccinated. IHS is working with tribes, states, and CDC to address routine childhood immunization coverage and bring children back in for their required immunization. Regarding the influenza season, 
Indian Health Service, Tribal, and Urban Indian Health Programs provide influenza vaccine, vaccination services to American Indian and Alaska Native communities across the country. Data from the IHS Influenza Surveillance System for the 2020-2021 influenza season as of February 13th indicate 212,131 influenza vaccine doses have been administered. As of 12:31, the overall population coverage was 31%. Vaccination uptake was highest among our most vulnerable populations, specifically young children and elders. This coverage level is similar to the five-year-old average, five-year average of IHS. So we did see a slight decrease of five percentage points for children six to 23 months. And finally, regarding mandatory influenza vaccination of IHS healthcare personnel. Indian Health Service has had a policy requiring influenza vaccination among healthcare personnel since 2016 and monitors the healthcare personnel vaccination coverage rate. Policy is optional for tribal and urban Indian health programs. So far during the 2020-21 influenza season, as of December 31st, 88.7% of all healthcare personnel working for IHS have received influenza vaccination. Final cover statistics for the current influenza season will be tallied in April. This ends our report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Dr. Romero. Uh, on January 19th, the Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy released the uh, Vaccines National St Strategic Plan 2021 to 2025. Uh, following up on the 2010 National Vaccine Plan, this updated the product of guidance provided by a dozen or, or more federal agency partners and contributions from a host of stakeholders, many of whom are present at this meeting today. Uh, the National Vaccine Plan, which now has a five-year horizon, identified five goals, uh, vaccine innovation, safety, confidence, and ac access, along with global collaboration. Uh, it is accompanied by a national by national strategic, uh, strategic plans for HIV, STIs, and viral hepatitis, which were released at about the same time. The National Vaccine Advisory Committee, NVAC, uh, met virtually on February 4 and 5, 2021. Um, highlights from the meeting include updates from the Immunization Equity Subcommittee and the Vaccine Confidence Subcommittee. There was a panel discussion on the fear of needles and other effects on vaccination compliance. Uh, and the committee received a report on the newly released National Vaccine Plan that I mentioned earlier. NVAC will meet again on June 16 and 17, 2021. And that concludes my remarks. Back to you, Dr. Romero. Thank you very much. National Institutes of Health. Yeah, good morning. This is John Bagel from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. Uh, the NIH and the U.S. government continue to support pivotal phase three trials for COVID-19. This includes the Janssen vaccine that Dr. Fink uh, mentioned and will be discussed by ACIP on Sunday. Uh, it, it also includes the Novavax vaccine. Earlier this week, Novavax announced that their uh, phase three study had been fully uh, enrolled. Um, yet last night, uh, Moderna announced their strategy for testing the SARS-CoV-2 variant uh, known as uh, B1351. Uh, that variant was uh, the variant uh, first identified in the Republic of South Africa. Um, uh, part of the uh, development strategy includes NIAID conducting a phase one trial of that vaccine uh, candidate. The candidate itself is known as mRNA-1273351. Um, and NIAID will provide additional information when the trial begins and, and the details will be on clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, for non-COVID uh, related activities, we continue to try to advance uh, vaccines for other uh, critical diseases. This includes uh, uh, gonorrhea. Uh, there's a, a study that has just uh, begun enrolling. Uh, uh, it evaluates Bexero. Bexero is a licensed vaccine that uh, to prevent uh, Neisseria meningitides type B, uh, and uh, it is uh, it is uh, being evaluated to see if it can also pr uh, protect against infection with uh, gonorrhea. It's a very exciting study, so we're 
we're very uh, enthusiastic to get that enrolled and, and see the, the data. Uh, and then we also continue to advance uh, uh, other uh, vaccine candidates, uh, such as uh, the uh, novel influenza vaccine platforms. Uh, we will provide details for all of these uh, in our written uh, update, and, and that concludes the updates from the NIH. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, I just muted myself. Um, thank you very much. Um, we'll now proceed with uh, today's presentations. We have, we'll have presentations on pneumococcal vaccines, zoster vaccines, influenza vaccines, cholera vaccine, and orthopox is uh, orthopox vac virus vaccines today. Um, so we'll begin. Um, Dr. Paling, uh, would you please uh, give the introduction for pneumococcal vaccines? Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Romero. Yes. Um, we're excited to share all that's been going on for pneumococcal vaccines. Next slide. And a very special thank you to all the members of the pneumococcal vaccine work group. As you'll be able to see during the presentation, there's been a lot of activity going on. A special thanks to all the ACIP members, the ex officio members, our CDC lead, Dr. Miwako Kabashi, our liaison representatives and consultants. Next slide as well as the CDC contributors and our grade ETR consultants. Next slide. All right, the pneumococcal work group terms of reference include a review of current data, including efficacy, effectiveness, immunogenicity, epidemiology, and cost-effectiveness of pneumococcal conjugates and polysaccharide vaccines, and to assess the strength of the evidence for each. A review of current recommendations considering up to date evidence and revise or update recommendations for pneumococcal vaccine use as needed. Next slide, please. The history of ACIP um, pneumococcal vaccine recommendations um, include a lot. So it begins in uh, 1984 with the pneumococcal polysaccharide 23 vaccine for adults over 65 years of age and individuals with underlying conditions. In 2000, pneumococcal conjugate vaccine 7 was recommended for children, and then in 2013, that was replaced with pneumococcal conjugate vaccine 13. Then, um, pneumococcal conjugate 13 was recommended for adults with immunocompromising conditions, in addition to the polysaccharide vaccine in 2012. In 2014, all adults over 65 years of age um, were included in the pneumococcal conjugate 13 vaccine followed by um, polysaccharide. And then in 2019, the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine was based on shared decision-making for all adults over 65 years of age with routine polysaccharide vaccine because the children's disease burden had significantly decreased the adult. Next slide. So, the changes in ACIP adult pneumococcal vaccine recommendations are shown here. For adults aged 19 to 64 years of age with chronic medical conditions, you can see that um, polysaccharide vaccine has been continuously recommended. The changes occur for adults aged over 65 years of age, where in 2020, we started with the polysaccharide vaccine. 2014, it was the pneumococcal conjugate 13 followed by polysaccharide, and then in 2019, it became a shared decision-making over the uh, pneumococcal 13. For immunized, for adults over age 19 with immunocompromising conditions, functional or an anatomic asplenia, PSF leaks, or cochlear implants, you can see the recommendations have been consistent with pneumococcal conjugate vaccine followed by polysaccharide um, across these years. Next slide. So the anticipated timeline for licensure of higher valent pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, um, we know that um, the Pfizer PCB20 was filed to the FDA in October 20 and that Merck's PCV15 was filed to the FDA November 20. So it is anticipated that licensure of these vaccines will occur in um, the later summer of this year, and it is expected that there will then be um, 
studies to lead to licensure for um, children after the adult. Today, we are going to have the following sessions. We're going to start with the current epidemiology of pneumococcal disease and pneumococcal vaccine coverage in U.S. adults. We're going to follow that by a presentation from Pfizer with the PCV20 phase 2-3 study results in adults. We're going to follow that with a presentation by Merck on the PCV15 phase 2-3 results in adults. And then they're also going to share adults um, studies about adults with underlying conditions. And then um, we're going to end with considerations, the work group's considerations for PCV15 and PCV20 use in adults. So when you look at the proposed timeline of ACI pre presentations, you see that we are presenting the epidemiology and new product information, and we'll be uh, sharing the policy questions proposed by the work group. The goal is for, in June, a presentation on the cost-effectiveness analysis and the public health impact, as well as the ETR and grade. And that would position us for a vote from October of this year, assuming that the products are licensed. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll go forward then and have um, Dr. Gerke uh, present uh, current epidemiology of pneumococcal disease and pneumococcal vaccine coverage in U.S. adults, please. Thank you and good morning. We'll begin by reviewing recent invasive pneumococcal disease, or IPD, data, looking at the impact of PCV13 on IPD burden and serotype distribution. We'll also examine IPD, IPD burden caused by serotypes covered by the new conjugate vaccines, PCV15 and PCV20. We will then review what we know to date about the impact of PCV13 on all-cause pneumococcal and vaccine-type pneumonia as well as recent estimates of pneumonia incidence in adults and proportion of pneumonia caused by PCV15 and PCV20 serotypes. Finally, we'll review data on pneumococcal vaccine coverage to date in adults. Current pneumococcal vaccines in use and serotypes covered by each are presented in this table. 13-valent pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, or PCV13, covers 13 serotypes highlighted in yellow in the table. In the analysis I will present, we grouped serotype 6C with PCV13 serotypes due to cross-protection from 6A antigen in the vaccine. A 23-valent polysaccharide vaccine, or PPSV23, contains 11 serotypes not included in PCV13, shown here in red. We'll refer to these 11 unique serotypes as PPSV23, non-PCV13. Data on IPD are obtained from the Active Bacterial Core Surveillance, or ABCs. ABCs is an active, population-based surveillance at 10 sites across the U.S. Cases are defined as pneumococcus isolated from a normally sterile site in residents of the 10 surveillance areas. Oh, yeah. Isolates are serotyped at reference laboratories using whole genome sequencing, quellin, or PCR, and serotypes are grouped for analysis by vaccine type. U.S. Census Bureau estimates were used as denominators to calculate incidence rates for overall and serotype-specific IPD as cases per 100,000. This graph shows the incidence rates of IPD among children under 5 from 2007 through 2018. After introduction of PCV13 in 2010, rates of PCV13 type IPD, shown here in orange, declined sharply. Comparing 2007 and 2008 rates to 2017 and 2018 rates, we observed an almost 90% reduction in PCV13 type IPD. This resulted in a 68% reduction in overall IPD, shown here in blue, over the same time period. 
After 2013, declines in PCV13 type IPD rates plateaued at less than two cases per 100,000. Rates of non-PCV13 serotypes in black remained relatively stable over this time period, and we're not observing replacement disease by non-vaccine serotypes in children. Here are the incidence rates for adults aged 19 to 49 years shown on the left, and adults 50 to 64 are shown on the right. Rates among adults 19 to 49 are lower than adults 50 to 64, but the trends over time are similar. PCV13 type rates declined in both age groups after PCV13 introduction in children due to the indirect effects of the vaccine. This led to a decline in overall IPD. PPSV23 non-PCV13 rates shown in gray have been relatively stable in both age groups and since 2012 contribute to higher rates of PCV13 types. Rates of non-vaccine types shown in yellow declined slightly among 19 to 49 year olds, but remained stable in ages 50 to 64. Among adults 65 and older, as with younger adults, after introduction of PCV13 in children, we see a decrease in rates of PCV13 serotypes, which drives a decrease in overall rates of IPD. Please note the change in y-axis here, as older adults have overall higher disease rates than younger adults and also children. Declines in PCV13 type rates plateaued in 2014, around the same time they plateaued in children, and no additional declines in PCV13 type IPD were observed after PCV13 was recommended for adults aged 65 years and older in late 2014. PPSV23 non-PCV13 types and non-vaccine type rates of disease have remained stable and, since 2012, contribute to higher rates than PCV13 serotypes. We examined IPD rates for individual serotypes in PCV13 plus 6C among children less than 5 from 2011 through 2018. The serotypes in the original 7-valent conjugate vaccine are grouped together in gray, except for 19F, shown in yellow. After PCV13 introduction in children, rates of disease declined for many PCV13 serotypes. However, reductions were not seen in serotypes 3, shown here in green, or 19F, which together accounted for 70% of remaining PCV13 type disease in 2017 and 2018. Serotype 19A, shown here in reddish brown, has declined substantially, but still accounts for around 20% of remaining disease. Similar trends are observed in the incidence rates for individual serotypes in PCV13 plus 6C among adults 65 and older. Again, note the increase in y-axis due to higher incidence rates. Serotype 3 and 19F did not decline after introduction of PCV13 in either children or adults. Serotype 3 alone accounted for 60% of PCV13 type disease in 2017 through 2018, while serotype 19F accounted for 9%. Serotype 6 C, shown in purple, declined, but still accounts for around 15% of remaining disease. As with children, 19A declined, but still contributes to remaining disease. Among ages 19 to 64, trends in incidence rates for individuals, individual PCV13 plus 6C serotypes were similar to trends observed for children and adults 65 and older. In terms of remaining PCV13 type disease in 2017 and 2018, among both 19 to 49 year olds and 50 to 64 year olds, serotype 3 was the most common PCV13 serotype, with serotypes 19F and 19A also contributing to remaining disease. One difference among these age groups compared to older adults and children is that serotype 4 included in the original PCV7 formulation has increased recently. It made up 26% of remaining PCV13 type disease in adults 19 to 49 years old and 10% in adults 50 to 64. Investigations found that increase in serotype 4 were primarily among adults experiencing homelessness. We'll now examine the current IPD burden among PCV15 and PCV20 serotypes. 
In this table, in addition to the currently available pneumococcal vaccines in yellow, serotype coverage for the new conjugate vaccines is presented in green. PCV15 contains the 13 serotypes in PCV13, plus serotypes 22F and 33F. For analysis purposes, we'll refer to these two serotypes as PCV15 non-PCV13. PCV20 contains the 15 serotypes in PCV15, plus the five serotypes shown here, which are 8, 10, 11A, 12F, and 15BC. For analysis purposes, we'll refer to these as PCV20, non-PCV15. Finally, there are four remaining serotypes unique to PPSV23. We will refer to these as PPSV23, non-PCV20. Here are the incidence rates for the serotypes and the three different conjugate vaccine formulations among adults aged 19 to 64 from 2011 through 2018. Ages 19 to 49 are shown on the left and ages 50 to 64 on the right. PCV13 type IPD is shown in black and gray stripes. PCV15 non-PCV13 serotypes shown here in light gray remain stable in recent years and in 2007 through 2018 contributed to half a case per 100,000 for adults 19 to 49 and two cases per 100,000 for adults 50 to 64. PCV20 non-PCV15 serotypes shown in dark gray have also remained stable in recent years. In 2017 through 2018, they contributed about one case per 100,000 among adults 19 to 49 and three cases per 100,000 for adults 50 to 64. Similar trends are observed in adults aged 65 and older over the same time period and compared to what we observe among younger adults with higher incident rates for each serotype group. PCV15 non-PCV13 types contributed to around three and a half cases per 100,000 and three and a half cases per 100,000 for PCV20 non-PCV15 type disease. This graph shows the proportion of IPD by vaccine type in 2017 through 2018 for various age groups. PCV13 types are shown in light blue. PCV15 non-PCV13 type disease in orange accounted for an additional 15% of IPD. PCV20 non-PCV15 type disease shown in gray accounted for an additional 15 to 20% of IPD. PCV15 and PCV20 serotypes together accounted for 28 to 37% of disease. PPSV23 non-PCV20 shown in yellow accounted for 3 to 14% of IPD depending on age group. Non-vaccine types in dark blue accounted for 22 to 37% of IPD. And children less than 5 and adults 65 and older had a higher proportion of non-vaccine types compared with adults 19 to 64. For the impact of PCV13 on all-cause pneumonia in adults, we'll first review findings from recent studies examining the impact before PCV13 introduction in adults 65 and older, which is before 2015. These measure the indirect effects of vaccine use in children. An analysis of U.S. Healthcare Costs and Utilization Project, or HCUP data, between 2010 and 2014 found no reductions in all-cause pneumonia among adults. A study analyzing U.S. adult healthcare claim claims data for years 2007 through 2010 and comparing to years 2013 through 2015 found a reduction of 4 to 19 percent in all-cause pneumonia depending on the risk group and age group. As age increased, the impact declined, and no reductions were observed among adults aged, six, uh, aged 75 years or older. Next, we'll review recent findings from studies examining the impact after PCV13 introduction in adults 65 and older. So this is after 2015. These studies measure the indirect effects of vaccine use in children and the direct effects of vaccine use in adults 65 and older. A Louisville cohort study comparing data in 2014 through 2016 observed a 14% reduction in all-cause pneumonia 
among adults 65 and older. Next, we'll examine PCV13 impact on pneumococcal pneumonia in adults. Again, we'll start by reviewing findings from recent studies examining the impact before 2015, looking at indirect effects. The same H-cup analysis that did not find reductions in all-cause pneumonia did find declines in pneumococcal pneumonia for adults, with the exception of adults 75 years and older. The same analysis of healthcare claims data, which found reductions in all-cause pneumonia, showed a 22 to 51 percent reduction in pneumococcal pneumonia. However, similar to the H-cup analysis, no reductions were observed in adults 75 years and older. Using CDC surveillance of hospitalized non-bacteremic pneumococcal pneumonia, or SNP, we can observe the impact of PCV13 on pneumococcal pneumonia in adults. From 2013 through 2014, before introduction of PCV13 in adults 65 and older, non-bacteremic pneumococcal pneumonia declined in all adults. Adults aged 65 and older, shown here in gray, saw a 41% reduction, while adults 50 to 64 in orange saw a 34% reduction, and adults 18 to 49 in blue saw a 36% reduction. Comparing years 2014 to 2017, after several years of PCV13 use in adults 65 and older, no reductions in pneumococcal pneumonia were observed in adults age 65 and older, or in the other two age groups. Serotype distribution of cases is unknown, so we are unable to examine the impact of vaccine type pneumonia. There are a few studies that examine the impact of PCV13 on vaccine type pneumococcal pneumonia in adults. Data from a recent United Kingdom cohort study shows indirect effects of vaccine use in children since the UK did not introduce PCV13 in adults based on age. Among patients 16 years and older from 2013 through 2018, an increase in PCV13 non-PCV7 serotypes was observed with an incident rate ratio of 1.12. The driver of this increase was serotype 3, which accounted for 57% of PCV13 non-PCV7 serotypes. Moving to studies looking at both direct and indirect effects of vaccine in the U.S. after 2015, data from the Louisville cohort study found a 31% reduction in PCV13 type pneumonia. Among data from a multi-center surveillance of hospitalized pneumonia, including Louisville, serotype 3 was the most common PCV13 serotype, accounting for 37% of vaccine type pneumonia in 2015 and 2016. Now we'll review pneumonia burden among adults. Estimates of pneumonia burden among adults have a wide range for several reasons, including the data sources used, definition of pneumonia used, and the health and age of the populations examined. In 2018, we previously reported to the committee a range based on studies of all-cause pneumonia among ages 65 and older using data from 2007 through 2016. Estimates range from 630 to 2,300 cases per 100,000. Since 2018, additional publications and a recent systematic review of all-cause pneumonia allowed us to examine additional data, restricting to more recent data in the systematic review from 2010 to 2016 gave estimates ranging from 847 to almost 3,400 cases per 100,000 among adults 65 and older, a range of 126 to 422 cases per 100,000 among adults less than 65. Recent estimates based on four North American papers found approximately 11% of all-cause pneumonia are pneumococcal pneumonia. Studies specifically examining pneumococcal pneumonia among adults aged 65 years and older using data from 2007 through 2017 found a range of 33 to 100 cases per 100,000. 
Finally, we estimated the proportion of vaccine type pneumococcal pneumonia from a multi-center surveillance study of hospitalized pneumonia using Pfizer's serotype specific urine antigen detection or SSUAD. SSUAD can detect the 23 vaccine serotypes. Please note the proportions on the graph are out of all cause pneumonia. Two time periods were available, 2014 to 2016 and 2019 to 2020. Also note the 2019 to 2020 time period is preliminary with significantly smaller sample. Data are courtesy of Pfizer. PCV13 types are shown in light blue, and among these serotypes, serotype 3 increased from around 1% to 2% of all-cause pneumonia. Otherwise, the proportions remain fairly consistent with PCV15, non-PCV13 type disease in orange accounting for around 1% of all-cause pneumonia while PCV20, non-PCV15 type disease in gray, accounted for around 1.5% of all-cause pneumonia. Finally, PPSV23, non-PCV20, shown in yellow, accounted for around 1% of all-cause pneumonia. Now I'll provide updated pneumococcal vaccine coverage for U.S. adults. The data on this slide show coverage for pneumococcal vaccines among Medicare beneficiaries aged 65 years and older. The proportion of beneficiaries that receive PCV13, shown in gray, increased steadily after the age-based recommendations were introduced in late 2014. By 2019, around 50% of older adults had received at least one dose of PCV13, and included in this number is the 23% who received both PCV13 and PPSV23, which is the bar shown in yellow. The proportion that received PPSV23, shown in orange, has remained stable at around 45%. This table shows coverage for pneumococcal vaccines among Medicare beneficiaries aged 65 years and older in 2019 by race or ethnicity. White beneficiaries had the highest pneumococcal vaccine coverage, and Hispanics had the lowest. If you look at coverage among Medicare beneficiaries aged 65 years and older with immunocompromising conditions, we see a similar trend to what was observed in all adults, with PCV13 vaccination coverage increasing after the 2014 age-based recommendations. Note that despite the ACIP recommendations to give both PCV13 and PPSV23 in adults with immunocompromised conditions in 2012, PCV13 coverage did not really increase until after the 2014 recommendations. Here we're showing vaccination coverage from NHIS data for adults aged 19 to 64 with select underlying conditions that are indicated to receive either PCV13 in series with PPSV23 or PPSV23 alone. NHIS data cannot distinguish between PPSV23 and PCV13, but we did not see a large increase in coverage after the 2012 ACIP recommendations to give both PCV13 and PPSV23 in series among adults with immunocompromising conditions. However, Note that the group with PCV13 indication represents only a subset of the adults in this age group for whom the pneumococcal coverage was evaluated. This table shows the estimated proportion of adults aged 19 to 64 with underlying conditions who ever received pneumococcal vaccine based on 2018 NHIS data. Hispanics are the only age group with significantly lower coverage. In conclusion, among children and adults, overall and PCV13 type IPD incidence has plateaued since around 2013-2014. Incidence of invasive disease caused by PCV15 and PCV20 serotypes has also remained stable. There are opportunities to prevent an additional 30% of IPD burden among adults through new PCV use. All-cause pneumonia after pediatric PCV13 introduction saw modest declines among adults with less impact among older adults. Pneumococcal pneumonia declined in adults after introduction of PCV13 
with the largest impact through indirect effects. Direct effects through adult PCV13 use was not documented. Reductions in PCV13 type pneumococcal pneumonia were documented through PCV13 direct effects among adults, with serotypes 3 being the most common remaining PCV13 type pneumonia. Burden estimates for all cause, pneumococcal, and vaccine type pneumonia vary across studies. There are opportunities to prevent additional disease burden among adults through new PCV use. Among adults aged 65 years and older, PPSV23 coverage has been relatively stable. PCV13 coverage has increased to around 50% since 2014 recommendations for adults 65 and older. PCV13 coverage among adults greater than 65 years and older with immunocompromising conditions remained low before 2014. Pneumococcal vaccine coverage has been low, around 25% among adults 19 to 64 years with underlying conditions, despite the long-standing recommendation for PPSV23 use and the 2012 PCV13 recommendation for adults with immunocompromising conditions. Thank you, and I'll take questions. Thank you very much for that excellent overview and uh, information provided. Let me just get my participant list up. Um, so this is uh, this presentation is now open for discussion. Um, let me begin by asking the first question. Um, so uh, Dr. Messonnier mentioned that um, we're seeing we've seen a decline in uh, childhood vaccination, in particularly. Um, I, I'm curious to know if uh, we think that the decline in um, PCV13 immunization in children will have an impact on the epidemiology of uh, adult disease in the next year or so. Um, that's a good question, and it will be um, possibly difficult to look at because the serotyping is um, a little behind because of the pandemic, but we are working on getting at least 2019 data to update with this. Um, it is possible that it could lead to increases if coverage does drop in children because we see that majority of the effects are from indirect effect vaccination in children. Thank you. Are there any questions from the group, I saw a hand go up quickly. Uh, yes. yes Dr. Dr. Bell, is that uh, you? I see hands go up and down. I, so. did, I did put my hand up, but I think somebody else was ahead of me. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if we're having technical difficulties on that, but uh, go ahead, yeah. Dr. Bell. Okay, I will. Thank you. Um, thank you for just a really fantastic presentation. I really enjoyed it. And I have uh, two questions. Um, one of which at least may uh, show my lack of sophistication and knowledge about uh, pneumococcal uh, epidemiology. But um, the, the two questions are, uh, first of all, I'm impressed again by the um, unfortunate consistent story of poor vaccination coverage among adults, um, where it looks from what I can see that the incremental benefit, at least potentially, of improving vaccination coverage, even with PCB13 in adults greater than 65, would be appreciable. Um, and also, similarly, sadly, we see the same disparities in coverage um, that we've seen with um, other vaccines and um, in the uh, context of uh, COVID-19. So I'm just um, asking if um, you could perhaps reflect on uh, what information um, CDC has with respect to any particular barriers um, to uh, increasing coverage in this population and um, any plans or, or thoughts perhaps um, about what to do about that. And then the second question, which is um, uh, an easy one, I'm sure, is to just uh, explain what the story with the serotype 3 is with respect to um, the Sort of poor performance in terms of preventing serotype three of the vaccine. Sure. Um, maybe I'll start with uh, your second question. As you said, that's a little bit easier or more straightforward to answer. So, 
Serotype 3, we have not seen declines, um, we believe primarily because that has um, a different kind of capsule structure, which is difficult for the vaccine to target. So we believe that's why we're not seeing um, evidence, at least on a population level of effectiveness. There is in the um, clinical trials, it was documented to be effective against serotype 3 at the individual level. Uh, and in terms and the, of just a just a follow up question, I'm sorry. Um, the the uh, newly new, soon to be licensed vaccines is it the same series type three, or is there some p potential for the, those vaccines to be more effective against series type three? I, I think that will be uh, answered by the American Pfizer presentations. Okay, very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And hi, uh, this is Dr. Kobayashi, and I'm happy to um, provide some information about the question on vaccine coverage. So I, I think your question was uh, about, you know, why um, we are seeing the coverage that we reported today. And, you know, part of the reason may be because, um, so uh, there are limitations to the surveillance data that we used. Um, so the Medicare beneficiary data for 65 years and um, older, so that only captures uh, beneficiaries of Medicare A and B. So there um, could be um, potential. It, it may not be nationally representative, but you know that being said, um, you know it's possible that you know part of the challenges may be you know the the schedule that we currently have that um, is a bit you know complicated. Um, and then in terms of the younger adults uh, with immunocompromising conditions, so in general um, we have not seen. Um, uh, a lot of uh, coverage for a risk-based recommendation. So um, that's something that we've been, uh, we've observed consistently. Thank you very much, Dr. Goyesh. And Dr. Long. Yes, um, I'm wondering um, about this aspect. I wouldn't want us to conclude that uh, PCV immunization in adults had no benefit. Um, because there was a plateau, that, that those are the data, there was a plateau, but because we did not see an increase, uh, as was seen in the UK, who did not immunize adults, and because we had at best 50% uptake, um, it, it's possible that there is some direct benefit there that just can't be parceled out. Is that Correct, or am I missing something? Hi, um, this is Dr. Kobayashi. I can start. So, so we you know we know that the vaccines have um, are effective at the individual level, um, and then there are post licensure studies showing vaccine effectiveness. Um, however, what we presented, so we presented, you know both types of information, um, primarily impact. So if you look at population level impact, you know, what we reported is what we saw, uh, we, what we've been absorbing, which is, you know, plateau for um, IPD incidents in adults. Um, and then in terms of the differences between UK and US, you know, there are other differences such as uh, US has not seen the replacement disease that uh, European countries has seen, um, have seen. So, um, it's hard to say that it's purely due to differences in the vaccine uh, strategies. Yeah, thanks. I'll just add to that. Um, when I showed the individual serotypes, even though you know it looks like a plateau, you can see that some of the 19A and 19F are still declining, uh, but three is maybe slightly increasing. It, it's pretty small increases and declines, but there is still some variation in the individual serotypes. And it, it is, but it's very difficult to tease apart the indirect and direct effects of the vaccine. And that, that's why I also looked at the um, pneumonia data too to try and see if we could see, even though we're not seeing, we're seeing the plateau in IPD, we're trying to look at pneumococcal pneumonia to see if um, there's changes there. But we're also not really seeing declines in pneumococcal pneumonia, at least um, there is, as I am noted in the studies, there were some PCV13 specific studies that did show some declines after Thanks. the 2014 recommendations. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lee. 
Thank you. If you could move to slide 23. Um, I'm struck on slide 23 by uh, the lack of difference um, in terms of PCV 13 plus 6B uh, in terms of overall burden, uh, assuming that you know about 50% are vaccinated by that time, recognizing that those are individual um, changes and the serotypes might be sort of offsetting each other. I guess my question is really around whether or not you've been able to parse out on slide 23, whether the pneumonia vaccine type burden among adults uh, between 65 and 74 and greater than 75, since you've noted that perhaps um, the impact on 75 and older is less. Uh, than the younger, older adults. <laughs> um, so just wondering how much of this is because of age uh, versus like if we were to look at the 65 to 75, 74 year old age group, whether or not we'd see a larger decline in the blue amongst the pneumonia vaccine type burden. So uh, yes. Dr. Lee, could you please repeat the question no problem. And it's, it's sorry, I have a very circuitous way of asking the question. <laughs> um, so uh, this slide, to me, I think what's remarkable is that the blue, the PCV13 plus 6C, doesn't budge very much between 2014 to 2016 and then 2019 to 2020. And I'm, I'm actually surprised it didn't budge even a little bit. Uh, so to Sarah's question about the direct impact, my question about this particular slide is, can you break it down by 65 to 74 and then greater to 75? Because I'm wondering if there's age-specific differences in the efficacy of the vaccine uh, in the older adult population. Yeah, th thank you for your question. Um, yeah, it didn't budge, um, as you see, as, as we're observing with uh, invasive disease serotypes, serotype 3 is increasing while others are declining. So I think it's just... Um, that's part of the reason it is remaining stable here in um, vaccine type pneumonia also, but this is uh, data from Pfizer, so I do not believe we were just provided um, 65 and older. You could, we could ask them if they have additional breakdown to look at what's going on specifically in the older ages where we see that the vaccine might be less effective. Thank you. Dr. Sanchez. I was just wondering, with respect again, with um, Dr. Long and Lee's comments about adults, um, and looking and noticing the low vaccine coverage overall, could this also impact the fact that we're not seeing much of a difference? And do we really need to get adult coverage up to a significant amount, whether that's you know, 80, 90 plus percentage, to eventually see some decline? Um, yep, yeah, thanks. I, I think possibly, yeah, we could, it's hard to say because the coverage has been around 50, but I mean, as the coverage went up from close to zero to 50, we didn't see much of an impact. So uh, it's hard to say if we would see it further than that. And again, the, the majority of declines are from stopping the transmission from children, vaccinated children to adults, I believe. Thank you. Dr. Hutchins. Good morning. I was also um, going to make a similar comment uh, that Dr. Sanchez made. When you look at the child vaccination coverage, it is very high, and you can see the impact. So um, I was wondering the same thing, that you may at a higher vaccination coverage among adults the uh, true impact and the fact that there doesn't seem to be replacement like in the UK that did not introduce adult vaccination that um, that that should be considered my question is um, is about the ABC surveillance system and whether um, any differences by race and ethnicity have emerged Look, uh, so, sorry, your question was if there was differences in rates by race and ethnicity? Yeah, for IPD as well, among adults, IPD as well as pneumonia. 
Hi, this is Dr. Kobayashi. To, so to answer your question about um, IPD incidents by race, uh, we do pr provide that um, in our later presentation, the last uh, presentation of the session. But the short answer is yes, we have observed some differences by race. Uh, in terms of uh, pneumonia data, um, we, we don't have um, that data um, available today, but um, we're happy to um, provide that in future meetings. Thank you. Dr. Schmader. Hi, Dr. Schmader, AGS. Uh, following on Dr. Long's comment, the analyses showing no direct impact of PCD13 on IPD in adults over the age of 65, the population level, I wonder if it takes into account the heterogeneity of health states and older adults. And specifically, we know that older adults residing in nursing homes or have multiple comorbidities or chronic heart disease, for example, are at higher risk for IPD and, and may benefit from direct effects, uh, even at the individual level, like I just mentioned before. So, were the analyses adjusted for these conditions? Sorry, for the conditions in different states? Things like residing in nursing homes, multiple comorbidities, et cetera. No, the, uh, no, we do not adjust for that. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Goldman, please. Thank you very much. Uh, just more of an observation on the coverage and uptake. Um, you know, certainly from the primary care perspective and what we deal with in the office setting, you know, the age-based uh, approach really may help with coverage and uptake and simplifying the schedule. So it'd be interesting to see, you know, future data, what would happen if we went with more of an age-based as opposed to a risk-based approach on the vaccine uptake. Um, I think that might show an improvement, perhaps, of um, of the the graphs, but only time will tell. I certainly know it will definitely make a more uh, more of an impact on the individual patient and the providers being able to give those vaccines with a more simplified schedule. Over. Um, thank you for that comment. And I just wanted to uh, go back to some of the earlier comments about why uh, we did not see population level impact. So you might have seen in the serotype specific trends that um, serotype 3 um, constitute a large proportion of a remaining PCB13 type disease. And, um, and then, uh, you know, that for both IPD and pneumonia. Um, and uh, probably that's why we are seeing a plateau. Of um, in terms of population level impact. And that's what was observed in UK as well in terms of uh, serotype 3 being like the remaining, uh, most common remaining PCB13 type. Thank you. Dr. Talbot. Yeah, this is just a comment. Um, pediatricians do an amazing job vaccinating children, and pneumococcus has been highly successful because it is a very, very simple recommendation that is age-based. So just something to consider to increase the adults. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Maldonado. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, in reference to the comment, thank you, Chip. I was going to say something along those lines as well. But I do recall that in, uh, re relative to the direct versus indirect effects that we're discussing today, I think uh, I was also concerned back in 2019 when we were discussing uh, the uh, vaccination of adults and, and the benefits of direct versus indirect effects here. Um, and, I, and I was pretty happy to hear that we had settled on shared decision making exactly because of the issues that have been brought up. I think, you know, clearly, uh, efficacy has been well established in, in all of these age groups. There are just stereotype differences and probably risk-based differences. And so my only my only comment would be that uh, I do think that um, it's hard to really get tease out, um, you know, all of the nuanced and direct effects that we might be missing here, especially in light of COVID and decreased immunization of kids. So I I think this shared approach is really important to continue. Um, and to continue to monitor, and I congratulate the group for monitoring this uh, post the shared decision making uh, model because I, I do you know, obviously we, we know that these vaccines will continue to have direct as well as indirect effects. So I, I think um, that both are at play here, and we may not be able to measure them with the granularity that that we would like unless we look back over time. It would be a shame to. Um, to lose that impact um, of direct vaccination on the older population. And then finally, that 
um, in many models, as we know, as we get uh, to closer to the asymptote to, to, to zero, it's harder and harder to do risk-based strategies um, effectively. And I agree that age-based makes a lot more sense, and at least for the pediatric model, it's much easier to do. Thank you. Dr. Long. Um, just to be sure, again, that I've understood the data well, I don't think you need to bring up the slide. You can probably just answer it. Um, it, it did appear that we do have data that a, an age base compared with a risk-based analysis uh, increases immunizations. Didn't we see that in the increase in percent of those who were the risk-based um, uh, underlying conditions, et cetera, go up uh, after the full recommendation by age. So do we already have some evidence of that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, that was kind of the point of showing that um, that the in a, you know, compromised individuals, the uptake was didn't start until, you know, the recommendation started in 2012. But the uptake didn't start of PCV13 until really after the age-based recommendations in 2014. Thank you. You're correct. Thanks. Are there any other questions from the voting members or the liaisons? Seeing none. Um, thank you very much for that uh, excellent presentation and for the question answered. Um, and um, we'll move on to the next presentation by Dr. Watson on uh, PCV20 phase two slash three study results in adults. So good morning, and my name is Wendy Watson. I am the Pfizer Global Clinical Program Lead for the 20-valent pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, referred to as PCV20 in this presentation. And I thank you for the invitation to speak to you today about this next generation pneumococcal conjugate vaccine and the results from our phase three studies in adults. Next slide. PCV20 contains the components of Prevna 13, uh, PCV13, plus seven additional conjugates to broaden disease coverage for pneumococcal invasive disease and pneumonia in adults. The seven additional conjugates were modeled on the Pfizer PCV13 platform, and PCV20 essentially represents an extension of PCV13. Licensure of PCV20 will be based on acceptable safety profile and immunogenicity comparable to the PCV13 for the 13 match serotypes and polysaccharide vaccine for the seven additional serotypes. We are seeking the same indications as PCV13, and the FDA has granted breakthrough designation for our programs in adults and children, recognizing the potential for PCV20 to uh, improve on existing vaccines and address an unmet medical need. We are developing PCV20 for both adults and pediatric populations, and phase three pediatric studies are ongoing. The focus today is the adult program, which is currently under review by the SBA. I have the timeline uh, below. If you could go to the next slide. We conducted two phase one studies and one phase two study that served as a pilot for our pivotal study design prior to conducting three phase three studies to meet regulatory requirements for PCV20. The study designs were generally modeled on PCV13 studies in adults, and the study populations included over 4,000 adults who received PCV20, with more than 1,000 of these 65 years of age and older. Adults with stable chronic medical conditions, <clears throat> such as diabetes and COPD, and individuals with prior pneumococcal vaccination. Since PCV13 has been formally studied in adults and stem cell transplants and uh, recommended in the past. And since PCV20 is being developed on the foundation of PCV13, we did not conduct a study in immunocompromised populations. The pivotal study included a primary comparison of PCV20 to the licensed vaccines in a, the adults 60 years of age and older, as well as an immunogenicity bridge to younger adults as was done with the P PCV13 program. We also described immunogenicity of PCV20 in adults 65 years of age and older with prior pneumococcal vaccine, reflecting current immunization history of many seniors in the United States. There's also an ongoing study of PCV20 with influenza vaccine. This will not be in our initial filing, but data is expected this summer. Next slide. 
Ophthalmophagocytic activity, OPA, is a measure of antibody killing of streptococcus pneumoniae that correlates with vaccine activity. But there's no absolute level or minimal response that predicts protection against pneumococcal disease in adults. The primary measure of vaccine response in our program were OPA geometric mean titers, GMTs, to the vaccine serotypes. A statistical non-inferiority comparison was made between each serotype in PCV20 and the corresponding control vaccine. This is consistent with the approach for the PCV13 licensure program in adults. The pivotal non-inferiority comparisons are shown in the figure with a comparison to PCV13 for the 13 match serotypes, the blue row, and to the polysaccharide vaccine for the seven additional serotypes in the purple row. Of course, more than just antibody levels are to be taken into consideration in evaluating the benefits of the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. Additionally, failure to meet non-inferiority does not directly translate into lower protection, and it was agreed uh, in advance with the FDA that if the statistical criterion for non-inferiority was not met for a given serotype, the totality of data for that serotype could be used to provide evidence that the responses still were likely to confer protection. And use of totality of data is not new and was used in the past for assessing PCB13 in the infant population. Next slide. So in this, ta this table summarizes the three phase three studies. Um, in the top row is our pivotal study in nearly 4,000 participants, 18 years of age and above. In the middle row is our descriptive study in adults 65 years of age with prior pneumococcal vaccine. And in the bottom row is the clinical lot consistency study, which is an FDA requirement for licensure to show that the vaccine can be consistently manufactured. Safety was assessed in all three studies, and each study had immunogenicity objectives. You have, you will have these slides um, after the presentation. You can refer to them uh, for additional details, which I won't cover right now in the uh, interest of time. You can move on. I will like to uh, focus on the uh, pivotal study, however. Uh, so this slide shows the design of the pivotal phase three study and the assessments, safety assessments. Working from the left side to the right, you can see that the participants were enrolled into three cohorts based on age, and you can also see the numbers of subjects in each cohort there. Participants were randomized to receive PCV20 or PCV13 at study entry, for those 60 years of age and above, that's the top row there, uh, a dose of saline placebo or polysaccharide vaccine was also administered one month later. The one month interval between, between the PCV13 and the polysaccharide vaccine in the control group was not meant to mimic sequence recommendations, but rather to allow for a timely vaccine control for the immune responses to all 20 serotypes. The pilot phase two study I had demonstrated that this would be suitable uh, as a control vaccine schedule. Safety assessments are listed on the uh, right-hand side and our uh, solicited local reactions were collected, uh, systemic events and adverse events, all collected after the PCV20 or PCV13 uh, vaccinations. The time period for collection of these are listed on the right-hand side and also marked by the letter A in the blue box. Serious adverse events and newly diagnosed medical, chronic medical conditions were followed for six months after the first vaccination, marked by the letter B in the yellow box. If you go to the next slide, this table summarizes the demographics in the pivotal study and shows that there was a balance across groups for race and gender. Uh, one third of the participants in the pivotal comparison were 65 years of age and 25 to 35% of all groups included subjects with one or more medical condition or factor associated with increased risk of pneumococcal disease. So persons with risk factors for pneumococcal disease were well represented in this pivotal study. To go to the next slide. This slide summarizes the safety in the pivotal study. Rates of adverse events and serious adverse events observed in the study were similar in the PCV20 and PCV13 groups. And there were no serious adverse events considered related to vaccine uh, reported in the uh, phase three program in adults. These bar graphs 
show the percent of subjects with solicited events uh, after vaccination in the pivotal study by age group. The PCV20 group is in turquoise and the PCV13 group is in blue. Severity is denoted by the different hues within each bar. The percent of subjects with local reactions, redness, swelling, pain at the injection site are in the top graph and other solicited events of headache, fatigue, muscle pain, and joint pain are in the bottom graph. Fever was collected, but was uncommon, less than 2%, so not included in the graph. The majority of reactions were mild or moderate with low rates of severe reactions, and the rates of reactions were very similar between groups, as can be seen in, in these figures. Overall, the safety profile of PCV20 in the Phase 3 adult program was similar to that of PCV13. So moving on to the next slide. This figure shows the time points for the primary immunogenicity comparison in the pivotal study, which was um, conducted in participants 60 years of age and above. The immunogenicity for the 13 serotypes were compared uh, at one month after vaccination with PCV20 or PCV13, marked by the letter C in this schematic. The immunogenicity for the seven additional serotypes one month after PCV20 were compared to the control group one month after the polysaccharide vaccine, marked by the letter D. So my next slide has the results of the immunogenicity comparison. This figure is a bar graph of the OPA geometric mean titers plotted on log scale for each serotype before, those are the stripe bars, and one month after the specified vaccine, those are the solid bars. The results in the PCV20 group is shown in turquoise, the PCV control is in blue, and the polysaccharide vaccine control is in purple. You can see that PCV20 elicited robust responses to all 20 serotypes. The primary endpoint for the study is a comparison of uh, each serotype between the two solid bars. Non-inferiority criteria was to be met at the lower bound of the 95% confidence interval of the OPA geometric mean titer ratio, PCV20 versus control, was greater than um, uh, 0.5. So now the results. The OPA geometric mean titers of PCV20 met non-inferiority for to PCV13 for all 13 matched serotypes. Although there was a very slight decrement in the GMTs for many of the serotypes, compared to PCV13. They were all within a very close margin, not expected to be meaningful. The OPA geometric mean titers of PCV20 met non-inferiority to the polysaccharide vaccine for six of the seven additional uh, serotypes. That's the figure on the right-hand side. Non-inferiority was narrowly missed for serotype eight with a lower confidence interval of 0 uh, yeah, 0 0.49. Other data show evidence of a clear and robust response to serotype 8 after PCV20. Um, an example of this is shown in the table at the bottom of the slide. After vaccination with PCV20, 78% of subjects had a rise in OPA titer to serotype 8 that was fourfold or higher compared to baseline. This was well within the range of what was seen uh, with the 13 serotypes after vaccination with PCV13 in the control group. Therefore, and this trend was also seen with other measures of response, such as geometric mean fold rise. So overall, the data support the potential for PCV20 to elicit protective responses across all 20 vaccine serotypes. We go on to the next slide. This bar graph shows geometric mean titers to each serotype one month after PCV20 across three age groups in the pivotal study. The darkest bars on the left-hand side of each for each serotype are the results after PCV20 in 60 to 64 year olds. And this is the reference age group for comparison. Uh, and they're not noted for each serotype. The lighter color bars are in the middle are the results in the 50 to 59 year olds. And the rightmost bars um, show the data in the 18 to 49 year olds. The immunogenicity was similar or higher in the younger age groups to each of the serotypes, establishing a bridge to support licensure of PCV20 to adults uh, 18 years of age and older. 
in addition, um, in this study, we also looked at participants of all ages with chronic medical conditions and other factors that put them at increased risk for pneumococcal disease and find that the immune response to PCV20 reflects the findings in the overall study population. So if you can move on to the next slide. Finally, I just wanted to briefly touch on the study results of PCV20 in adults with prior pneumococcal vaccine. This was a single dose descriptive study to help provide useful information on PCV20 in individuals in this population. If you look at the box on the left, you can see that um, the different cohorts were those with prior polysaccharide vaccine only, and they received PCV20 or PCV13, uh, which served as a safety control. Those with prior PCV13 only, and they received PCV20 or PCV13. Uh, polysaccharide vaccine, which served as a safety control, and then those with both prior PCV13 and polysaccharide vaccine all received PCV20. Safety was assessed as in the pivotal study, and immunogenicity was measured in the PCV20 groups. We go on to the next slide. These are the OPA geometric mean titers for each of the 20 serotypes before, and those are the uh, pattern bars again and one month after PCV20 solid bars in the cohort with prior PCV13 and polysaccharide uh, vaccination, reflecting the current uh, pneumococcal vaccine recommendations uh, for sh shared decision-making. There is a response to all 20 vaccine serotypes after PCV20 in this cohort. The data in the other two cohorts also showed a response regardless of prior pneumococcal vaccination. Additionally, the safety and tolerability of PCV20 was similar across all the different cohorts. So in summary, you can move on to the last slide. In summary, PCV20 builds on PCV13 and contains seven additional conjugates to broaden coverage for pneumococcal invasive disease and pneumonia in adults. Regulatory authorities and the FDA have uh, granted um, breakthrough designation and recognizing the benefit of conjugate vaccine technology and long-term protection and importance for prevention of pneumonia. PCV20 has a safety profile to PCV similar to PCV13 and was immunogenic across all ages, including those with chronic medical conditions and regardless of prior pneumococcal vaccination. PCV13, I'm sorry, PCV20 offers a potentially simplified and impactful approach to the prevention of pneumococcal disease. And just uh, to note that PCV20, as I mentioned, is currently under review by the FDA. And um, based on our current timelines, we would anticipate licensure in early June of this year. So uh, thank you very much for your time today, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for that informative uh, and uh, detailed presentation. Um, so uh, Dr. Watson's uh, presentation is open for discussion or questions. Uh, Dr. Long. Uh, I wonder, Dr. Watson, I think we saw in the work group uh, something that looked more like a forest plot of yes. the responses of uh, two PCB13 serotypes, PCB13 versus PCB20, because these, you know, the geometric mean scale and, you know, it, it's, it's a, it, it makes things look very small when, in fact, I understand met non-inferiority, but may not be small. And then I wonder, Dr. Romero, if you would consider um, allowing our ex officio member from the FDA to enlighten us a little bit on this non-inferiority decision for this these vaccines where we don't have a serologic marker of protection, and if that is what is different than, you know, what we're usually used to for non-inferiority. So, so I can take that first question, and if uh, we can bring up back up slide 17. That's it. This, yeah. Yeah, this one. Yes. Because I'm yeah, try, trying to convey a lot of different things, uh, including... Yeah, you know, what we see before and after, but uh, yes, this is our forest plot showing the geometric mean uh, ratios. Um, the left-hand side is for the against the uh, 13 
stereotypes of Prevnar 13 or PCP 13, and the right hand side is, uh, you know, the geometric mean ratios uh, for the 23 polysaccharide vaccine. Um, and the geometric mean ratios range from 0.76 uh, for uh, 6A uh, and uh, to one for, for 14. Primarily, most of the serotypes were had a geometric mean ratio of around uh, 0.8, um, with lower bounds generally higher than um, point, well, the lowest was 0.66 or 6A. I guess I'm not, not maybe it's a question for um, yeah. FDA. Uh, I, the 0.5 is was set as the non-inferiority. And that doesn't seem usual, and it's probably that I just don't understand it. So, Dr. Long, thank, thank you for your request uh, to have the FDA um, representative uh, comment on this, but um, it's, it's not the, 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 the custom and practice of the ACIP uh, to have them uh, present uh, or to comment um, when it's not something that they're ready to present about. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask them not to comment at this moment um, and to give us more information in the future, but thank you. Thank, thank you. I guess I also would say that Primera 13 was licensed compared to polysaccharide based on point, the point 0.5 uh, non-inferiority criteria as well, just, just to note that. Thank you. Um, Dr. Paling. Hi. Thank you, Dr. Watson, for this nice presentation. And um, please leave the slide up because I think this is really important. I would like your insight. If I understand the spore spot, this is all based on immunocompetent adults um, over 60 years of age. And one of the questions I have is, um, what are the plans to look into immunocompromised adults? Um, and in the flu quad pneumonia study that you alluded to, are immunocompromised adults included in that study? Thank you. Yes. Uh no, they are not included in the, nor, nor is that the norm for usually for, for flu co-administration, you know, influenza vaccine co-administration uh, studies. Uh, there is a, a great wealth of experience and, and data with uh, PCV13 and, and even prior to that PCV7 uh, in immunocompromised uh, populations. And the decision was made not to repeat safety and immunogenicity studies with PCV20. We understand uh, that you know there generally is a, a PCV13 may elicit an immune response or does elicit an immune response in immunocompromised uh, populations. Again, there's no uh, level to indicate protection or not, but it, in that population, there certainly uh, is a, a potential benefit. And the safety profile as well of PCV13 in immunocompromised populations is very similar to the general population. So PCV20 is expected to perform similarly to PCV13 in these populations. I guess the reason I'm asking is because it appears the more that you put into the vaccine, you do have a slight reduction in the geometric mean ratio. And so what that is on immunocompromised would be very helpful. Uh, I get, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lee, please. Thanks, Dr. Romero. Um, thanks very much for commenting about the uh, uh, the similarities in effic or immunogenicity, sorry, with regard to comorbidities. It would be terrific to be able to see that information and recognizing you're not powered to look for differences, but qualitatively, that would be helpful. In addition to the age group question, um, particularly 75 and older, um, and then race ethnicity as well. I feel like um, since COVID vaccines, having that ability to be able to communicate with the public that yes, this vaccine is, you know, uh, looks very similar across age groups, comorbidities and race ethnicity has been extremely powerful. And particularly since there's been a historic um, a uh, difference in the burden of disease uh, with notable disparities uh, in the past. So I, I do feel like that would be extremely helpful for future communication. And, you know, appreciate very much that uh, you've developed this vaccine with a greater number of serotypes. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I can show if there's time. I can. I do have a couple of backup slides that might be helpful for two of those points that you mentioned. Please go ahead and, and if, if show those if you okay. wish, Dr. Watson. Yes. Okay. If you can bring up backup slide uh, number 24, uh, it speaks to the immune responses in um, uh, individuals right, uh, who received 20 valent. And we looked at the subpopulation of participants just with the, the risk factors that were identified. And then, um, uh, then compared to, or we plot that next to all participants. And this is from the pivotal uh, study. So you can see that there is a great similarity in those, that subpopulation. It was definitely a heterogeneous population of risk factors compared to everybody in the, in the study. Um, so it's, that's, this is reassuring. There is maybe some differences, but they appear to be uh, very small. And, um, and then for the age, I think the best backup slide I have is, is 26, which is two down from this. Yes. Okay. So just, I had bar graphs to show GMTs before, but this, these are showing dots because there's a lot to, um, you know, to, to show, but this is uh, the geometric mean titers for the different age groups, 60 to 64, 65, 69, 70 to 79, over 80. The blue dots are the PCV13. Uh, geometric mean titers. The purple dots are the PCV20 uh, geometric mean uh, titers. For, for each, this is just the 13 serotypes. It's to show you can cut, see the similarities then, you know, where PCV20 is, you know, has the same uh, similar pattern to uh, PCV13. And this is from the oldest, um, you know, the 60 year olds and above in uh, the pivotal study. Hopefully that's helpful. Thank you. Yes, and I agree. Um, mm -hmm. And looking at it, it looks qualitatively similar. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Just noting that in general, older age is, uh, and I always defer to my colleagues like Dr. Schmitter and Dr. Talbot, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. with regard to um, the challenges with vaccination in that population. I mean, it'd be great yeah. to think about in the future, what are the opportunities to improve upon immunogenicity and efficacy of that population? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Bernstein. Uh, yes, thanks. Um, in thinking about the indirect effect of vaccination, I was wondering, um, do we know whether the impact on nasopharyngeal colonization by serotype differs between uh, adults and children after vaccination? Well, I think that, um, well, I can't answer that for PCV20. We don't have that. I, I think that just overall for nasal pharyngeal character uh, colonization, there may be a lower, uh, you know, there is a, a lower uh, level of carriage in, um, in adults. And it's somewhat, then that makes it somewhat difficult to and challenging to uh, study um, the vaccine effect on that. Uh, but I, again, all I can say um, is that for, for PCB20, we don't have that data. Thank you. Any other questions from the voting members or the liaisons? Not seeing any, I want to thank you again, uh, Dr. Watson, for the presentation and for uh, answering the questions presented to you. Um, let's go forward then with uh, Dr. Uh, Buckwald's presentation. Uh, PCV15 uh, phase uh, two slash three study results in adults, including adults with underlying conditions. Dr. Buckwell. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you. Um, I want to thank the committee first for inviting us to present the data on V114, our 15-valent pneumococcal polysac polysaccharide conjugate vaccine today. I'm Ulrike Buchwald, and I'm the lead um, for the Adult Clinical Development Program for V114. Just a, a brief overview over the presentation today. I will talk about the rationale for the development of V114 and give an overview of the adult clinical program and then followed by immunogenicity results and then safety results of 
key individual studies, followed by a conclusion and some time for question and answers. We have heard earlier today about the major role that serotype plays, serotype 3 plays in residual adult pneumococcal disease. Serotypes 22F and 33F have been added to V114 because they are frequent serotypes and also linked to antibiotic resistance for long hospitalization and increased 30 day mortality. And you can see here on these two graphs the proportion of IPD in adults that are caused by serotype 3 and serotype 22F and 33F as compared to the other serotypes in PCB13, PCB20, PPSV23, and also non vaccine serotypes. And despite the widespread use of PCB13 for 10 years, as we had heard, um, serotype 3 contributes to approximately 15% of all adult disease, and together the three serotypes um, address about 30% of residual disease in adults. Next slide, please. This leads us to the rationale for the development of V114, namely to increase the availability of safe pneumococcal conjugate vaccines to develop a single vaccine formulation for adult and pediatric use and um, to maintain robust immune responses to serotypes included in licensed PCVs without any immunogenicity loss that could lead to breakthrough disease while improving also the immunogenicity to serotype 3 and extending serotype coverage to major serotypes 22F and 33F. Next slide, please. Both the pediatric and the adult indication have received breakthrough designation, and the estimated U.S. licensure timeline for the adult indication under priority review is July 2021. The estimated filing timeline for the pediatric SPLA is the second half of 2021, pending approval of the adult indication. Next slide. The adult clinical development program was designed to evaluate V114 in adult populations with an unmet medical need for pneumococcal disease prevention and includes seven phase three studies and one phase two studies. Three studies, the pivotal study, the lot to lot consistency study, and the sequential study in which V114 is followed by PPSV23 12 months later were conducted in pneumococcal vaccine naive adults 50 years of age and older. A phase two study evaluated V114 in adults who had received PPSV23 at least one year prior to study enrollment. The concomitant use with seasonal influenza vaccine was evaluated in pneumococcal vaccine naive and experienced adults. A particular emphasis of our program were populations at increased and high risk for pneumococcal disease. In protocol 17, adults 18 to 49, years of age with well-defined at-risk conditions were enrolled. Protocol 18 was conducted in adults immunocompromised due to HIV infection, and Protocol 22 in hepatopoietic stem cell transplantation recipients. This latter study is still ongoing. Next slide, please. I would briefly touch, like to touch base on the study designs of our adult program, um, for which PCB13 was used as the active comparator in all but the influenza study. Um, this here is a single study, uh, single dose study design um, in which participants received V114 or PCV13 at day one and had blood loss pre vaccination and 30 days post vaccination. Safety assessments via the vaccination report card was conducted for 15 days. At that time, the AEs were reviewed by phone and then subsequently also in an in person visit at day 30. The phase three studies, participants were being followed for serious adverse events for six months after receiving V114 PCB13. You can also see the randomization schedule and the total number enrolled for each study at the bottom of the slide. Next slide, please. The sequential vaccination schedule that includes PPSV23 currently provides the broadest stereotype coverage for adults. In our program, three studies followed a sequential dosing schedule where administration of V114 or PCB13 was followed by PPSV23 at intervals of eight weeks in the study um, in HIV infected adults, six months in protocol 17, the at risk adults, and 12 months in protocol 16, adults 50 years of age and older. Blood draws were generally conducted pre vaccination and 30 days post vaccination and safety follow-up was conducted in the same way as for the single-dose study. Next slide, please. Aging and associated immunosenescence are among the most common risk factors for pneumococcal disease. Three studies were conducted in pneumococcal vaccine if adults 50 years of age and older, 
and randomization was stratified by age with age groups 50 to 64 years of age, 65 to 74 years of age, and 75 years of age and older. Next slide, please. Immunogenicity evalu evaluation in all studies was based on the evaluation of serotype-specific functional opsonophagocytic responses to all 15 serotypes in V114 as a primary endpoint. The serotype-specific OPA responses are accepted as basis for licensure of V114 and immunobridging studies. Serotype-specific IgG responses were also evaluated. The endpoints measured included geometric mean titers, geometric mean fold rise, and proportion of participants within at least fourfold rise of immune responses from pre-vaccination to post-vaccination. Reverse cumulative distribution curves were used to show the distribution of immune responses across the study population. Next slide, please. Our FIDDLE study had two primary immunogenicity objectives and one key secondary immunogenicity objective. For all objectives, immunogenicity assessments were based on the lower bound of the 95% confidence intervals for the between group differences. The first primary immunogenicity objective was to demonstrate non inferiority of V114 to BCV13 for the 13 shear stereotypes based on a two fold margin of the OPA geometric mean titers. The second primary objective was demonstrate superiority of V114 to BCV13 for the two unique serotypes based on a two-fold margin for the OPA-GMT ratio and an at least 10 percentage point difference in the proportion of participants with an at least four-fold rise of OPA titer. The key secondary immunogenicity objective evaluated superiority of V114 to BCV13 for serotype 3 based on a 1.2-fold margin for the OPA GMT and then at least zero percentage point difference in the proportions with a four-fold rise or higher. Next slide, please. Briefly, with regard to the baseline characteristics I have shown them to you in the pre-read, the baseline characteristics were well, uh, similarly distributed between the two groups. 60% of participants were 65 years of age and older, and 10% were 75 years of age and older. You can see here the first of three sl result slides for the pivotal study. The forest plot displays the ratio of the OPA responses for the comparison of V114 and PCV13. On the left side, at 0.5 is the non-inferiority margin. The green dots display the point estimates for the V114 to PCV13 ratio with a 95% confidence interval. V114 met the twofold non inferior criteria for the OPA GMT ratio for all 13 serotypes shared with PCV13. Next slide. With regard to the second primary immunogenicity objective to demonstrate superiority for serotypes 22F and 33F, shown here are the forest plot for the GMT ratio and the data for the difference in the fourfold rise in the lower panel. The OPA GMT ratio for the two serotypes were around 32 and 7, respectively, and the difference in the proportion of participants achieving a fourfold rise or higher was more than 50%, with a lower bound of the 95% confidence intervals for both endpoints meeting pre specified superiority criteria. Next slide. V114 is also superior to PCV13 for OPA responses to serotype 3 as the GMT ratio for OPA responses between V114 and PCV13 was 1.6 with a lower bound at 1.38, and the percentage point difference with an at least fourfold rise between the two groups was 11.5 with a lower bound of 6.0, thereby meeting pre-specified superiority criteria for both endpoints. Next slide, please. In this slide, I want to show you that V124 induced consistent OPA immune responses across different studies at 30 days post vaccination. Shown here are the OPA responses for the 15 serotypes in comparison with PCV13 across the three studies in pneumococcal vaccina if adults 50 years of age and older, namely Protocol 16, the sequential study, Protocol 19, the pivotal study, and Protocol 20, the lot consistency study. In the upper part of the panels, you can see the GMT ratio for the serotypes that V114 and PCV13 share, 
Across all three studies, immune responses to this, these serotypes were robust without significant loss as compared to BCV13. OPA responses to shared serotype 3 were consistently higher. In the lower panel, you can see the responses to 22F and 33F, and they were also consistent across the three studies. I'm not showing you due to um, the time, the um, results in protocol 7, the phase 2 study in adults that had previously received PPSV23, uh, those were provided in the previous, and in general, the findings were comparable with the findings in pneumococcal vaccine naive adults. Next slide, please. This slide shows you the post PPSV23 time point in protocol 16, the sequential study, where PPSV23 was given with an interval of 12 months following either V114 or PCV13. The OPA responses to all 15 serotypes measured 30 days after PPSV23 were comparable between participants in both intervention groups. This study also demonstrated that V114 induced immune responses that persist for at least 12 months following vaccination. Next slide, please. The importance of concomitant administration of pneumococcal and influenza vaccines is well documented. We evaluated the concomitant versus non-concomitant use of seasonal quadrivalent influenza vaccines in adults 50 years of age and older. And in this study, um, participants had either received PPSV23 at less one year prior or were pneumococcal vaccine naive. The influenza vaccine was of the 2018-2019 season. Next slide. You can see here that the concomitant administration of V114 met non-inferiority criteria for all 15 serotypes compared to the non-concomitant administration as assessed by serotype-specific OPA responses 30 days following administration in each group. The non-inferiority margin was twofold. Next slide. Concomitant administration is also non-inferior to non-concomitant administration when assessed by the influenza strain specific hemagglutination inhibition titers as shown here for all four influenza strains in the vaccine. Next slide, please. You've heard about the importance of chronic medical condition as a main risk factor for pneumococcal disease. Our study in immunocompetent adults 18 to 49 years of age is an important part of our development program and enroll participants who, despite their young age, would benefit from pneumococcal disease prevention due to those risk conditions. This was a sequential use study and one dose of PPSV23 was given to all participants six months after V114 or PCV13. It was a descriptive study. Next slide, please. I want to briefly touch on the baseline characteristics for this study as this is important. Almost 40% of participants were from Native American communities and enrolled via the Center for American Indian Health at Johns Hopkins University, as rates of pneumococcal disease are higher in this population. 25% of participants had no medical or behavioral risk factor, while 50% had at least one such risk factor, and 20% had two or more of these risk factors, a condition often referred to as risk stacking, which is associated with an even higher risk for pneumococcal disease. Chronic lung disease, blood, tobacco use, and diabetes were the most common individual risk factors. A distinguishing feature of this study is that participants had to meet protocol-specific criteria for the risk category they were enrolled into, so that disease stages are well described across the population. For example, participants with asthma had to demonstrate spirometric criteria and participants with liver disease had to have proof of cirrhosis on at least one diagnostic test. Next slide, please. In the upper panel, you can see that V114 was immunogenic for all 15 serotypes included in the vaccine as assessed by serotype-specific opiate 30 days post-vaccination. For most shared serotypes, OPA responses were generally comparable between the two vaccination groups. OPA responses for serotypes 22F and 33F were higher at that time point in V114 recipients and PCV13 recipients. Note that the y-axis is logarithmic to the differences in the magnitude of OPA responses for different serotypes. In the lower panel, you can see that 30 days post-vaccination with PPSV23 
The serotype-specific OPA responses for all 15 serotypes were generally comparable between the two groups. Next slide. As HIV infection remains an important risk factor for pneumococcal disease, we conducted protocol 18 in this, protocol, in this population. Participants had to receive antiretroviral therapy for at least six weeks prior to enrollment and had to have CD4 cell counts of 50 cells per microliter or higher. The majority of participants had CD4 cell counts between 200 and 500 cells per microliter. PPS323 was given after eight weeks. Next slide. The display here is the same as for the previous study. In the upper panel, you see that V114 was immunogenic for all 15 serotypes at 30 days following vaccination. OPA responses were generally comparable in the V114 and PCP13 group for shared serotypes and higher for the two unique serotypes. In the lower panel, you see that OPA responses to all 15 serotypes were comparable at 30 days following vaccination with PPSV23. Next slide. I want to briefly touch base again on serotype 3, given the role this serotype has in residual adult pneumococcal disease in the U.S. Next slide. In 2019, the CDC concluded that uncertainties remain regarding the benefits of PCV13 against serotype 3 disease, um, with evidence of population level of impact of PCV13 on serotype 3 burden lacking. It was therefore important for us to look at the immunogenicity of V114 against serotype 3 across all adult studies. Next slide. This slide shows you the OPA GMT for serotype 3 in both vaccination groups V114 and PCB13 across the five completed phase 3 studies as well as the phase 2 studies. Across various populations, V114 induced immune responses that were consistently higher compared to PCV13, in line with the demonstration of superiority um, of the OPA serotype 3 responses in the pivotal study. Pending real-world evidence, this has the potential to address the significant residual burden of pneumococcal disease associated with this serotype in adults. Next slide. I will now review key safety findings. Safety evaluation. Next slide. Sorry. In the adult V114 program was based on investigator review of data entered by participants on the vaccination report card. Our solicited endpoints included solicited injection site AEs of pain, erythema, swelling collected between day one and five post-vaccination, solicited systemic AEs of myalgia, arthralgia, headache, and fatigue, solicited for between day one and day 14, other non-serious AEs until day 15, and serious adverse events throughout the duration of the study for at least six months following V114. Next slide, please. The adult safety database consisted of around 7,400 adults, of whom 5,600 received V114. An integrated safety summary was performed for three studies in adults 50 years of age and older based on similarities of study design namely the sequential study, protocol 16, the pivotal study, protocol 19, and the lot through lot consistency study, protocol 20. Safety results of the other studies were summarized separately. Next slide. I will focus here on the safety review in this population um, in the integrated summary of safety. The majority of participants experienced at least one adverse event, Injection site adverse events were the most common. 40 to 45% of participants experienced systemic AEs, and 30 to 35% of participants experienced vaccine related systemic AEs. The number of participants with serious adverse events were few, and no serious adverse events were vaccine related, and few participants died. The proportion of participants experienced any AE was slightly higher in the V114 group compared to the PCV13 group, mainly due to injection site adverse events. Next slide, please. This bar chart shows the proportion of participants reporting solicited AEs and the severity of events in the um, ISS population. Injection site pain was the most common solicited AE in both intervention groups, fatigue and myalgia the most frequent systemic AEs. Most adverse events were mild to moderate in severity, with a proportion of participants reporting severe 
adverse events being one per less than 1% across all solicited adverse events. There was a small difference in the proportion of participants reporting injection site pain in the V114 group um, compared to the PCV13 group. However, that is not considered clinically significant based on the mild and transient nature of the adverse event. I'm not showing here the duration of the adverse events, but most adverse events um, lasted for less than three days. And also, I'm not showing the proportions of participants with elevated body temperature, which was very low in both vaccination groups. The data were provided in the pre -read. Next slide. With regard to the sequential administration, this data are for protocol 16, the sequential administration of PTSV-23, 12 months after V114 or PCV-13. In general, that sequential vaccination was well tolerated. Um, injection site pain was the most common solicited AEs, and all events occurred with comparable frequency in the two vaccination groups. The majority of events was mild to moderate in severity and of short duration. Next slide. I just want to briefly summarize um, the safety findings in key other populations. Overall, the safety profile of V114 was consistent with the safety profile in adults 50 years of age and older in the other populations studied, including immunocompetent adults 18 to 49 years of age who had increased risk for pneumococcal disease. Note that in this population, solicited adverse events were more frequent than in the older population, but this was observed in both intervention groups. B114 was also well tolerated when given with concomitant seasonal influenza vaccine, and also when given to adults who had previously received TPSV23 at, at least one year prior, as well as in adults living with HIV. Next slide. And then we can go to the next slide. With regard to the summary of our adult clinical development program, V114 is a vaccine that is well tolerated with a safety profile that is comparable to PCV13. With regard to immunogenicity, I would like to emphasize that the quality of serotype-specific immune responses is an important aspect when we consider how many cases of pneumococcal disease a vaccine can prevent. And I've shown you that V114 maintains robust immune responses to 12 shared serotypes with PCV13. This is important to maintain suppression of disease from this serotype. V114 is superior to shared serotype 3, the single most frequent serotype causing residual pneumococcal disease in adults. V114 adds protective immune responses to two epidemiologically important serotypes, 22F and 33F. V114 can be followed by PPSV23 to achieve broader serotype coverage in adults and be given this influenza vaccine to protect the adults from both diseases. Therefore, V114 has the potential to significantly address the burden of pneumococcal disease in adults due to the serotype included in the vaccine. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Buchwald, for that uh, very informative and uh, detailed presentation. Um, this presentation is open for discussion or questions. Dr. Sanchez. I, um, thank you. Thank you, Jose. I had a question. Uh, very nice presentation. Certainly, um, it's um, great to have um, to but my question was with respect to serotype 3. Um, com compared to, PV to PCB 13, you notice a, a superiority um, with respect to serotype 3 response. But when, we, when looking at the graph for the concomitant flu vaccine, I, the, the titers, the um, GMT titers seem to be um, Lower than when given alone, and I didn't. And it, you lose that superiority. Am, am I interpreting it differently, or? So, <clears throat> sorry if that was not clear. The the um the in concomitant influenza vaccine study 
did not um, include a PCV13 arm. Um, the concomitant um, use was studied with V114 plus the influenza vaccine given in the first group at the same day, followed by placebo 30 days later. And in the non-concomitant group, participants received influenza and placebo at day one, followed by V114 at day 30. So here, um, there in this study, in this forest plot, there is no PCV13 comparison. Now, I understand, but when in earlier, your GMT titer, I think, was like 216 when given without or without the PCV um, in the earlier one. I, I thought your GMT titers for serotype 3 were higher, and they seem to be lower now with concomitant use. Oh, okay. I see you're referring to the absolute GMT titers. Um, I mean, it's it's probably a little bit difficult to um, to compare them. You know, the absolute titers across studies. Um, I think that it is important to look within Protocol 21, the influenza study, at the two um, groups. Um, you know, the and compare. The V114 response in the non-concomitant group, which is at 30 days, you know, after a V114 was given, to um, you know the response in the concomitant group. Um, I mean, you know, small variations in the OPA GMT titers, I think, can be seen um, between different studies, uh, you know, because of variability. Now, that was my question was whether the concomitant use with the influenza vaccine had any effect on the response to serotype 3. Um, it didn't seem to be different between the two. Um, and when you looked at it, um, you know, with um, concomitant use or one month later, but it just seemed to be lower than in your previous study where you showed superior. Right, I agree. So the, um, I mean, the OPA GMT is, is is lower, the absolute OPA GMT. But as you point out, between the concomitant and the non-concomitant group, um, you know, the serotype three responses were, um, you know, very comparable. That I think is, um, right. Interesting. We want to pull this up. Um, slide nineteen, I think. And then we can also look again on um, on slide 28 and see, you know, in slide 28, you could also see that, you know, there are, I mean, the absolute OPMG, OPA GMT titers, they vary a little bit between the different studies, um, you know, which is also related to the um, inherent um, variability of some of these OPA measurements. Thank you. And another question, um, with respect to the adverse effects, particularly the local, or um, did you see any, you said that most of them occur in the first 72 hours of age. I just kind of, you know, with the COVID vaccinations, we're seeing some like at seven to 14 days, and it makes me think whether, did you see any uh, later um, you know, local reactions? I'm just trying to, yeah. So, yeah, no, I think that's a good question. Maybe we can briefly go to slide 33 just to have that visualized. So in general, our solicited injection site e um, um, events were, um, you know, or they were solicited for, for from day one to day five. But then we also, you know, um, would re um, record any um, injection site event that was, um, you know, reported by the participants. Um, from day six to day 14. Um, and um, we saw very little injection site events that were, um, you know, reported um, during that time. Uh, so there were very small numbers across the different studies that reported additional injection site events that did not start in the, within the solicitation period. Great. So we have uh, two more questions. So we're going to take a question from Dr. Paling and then Dr. Baker, and then we will wrap up. Hi. 
Um, thank you for this um, presentation. I wanted to um, ask questions about the safety profile. If I understood the, pro um, the presentation correctly, the 18 to 49-year-old immunocompetent persons with risk factors had more symptoms than did the older age group persons. And I wanted to um, ask, how did the immunocompromised persons compare and um, the timing of the symptoms? Thank you. Yeah, so thank you for that question. So protocol 17, you know, that is our immunocompetent in the younger adults. And um, in, in general, across both intervention groups, um, the, uh, there were a higher proportion um, of participants that reported AEs um, as compared to the older um, population group. However, the older populations in the 50 years of age and older studies However, that was, you know, um, overall fairly comparable between the um, the different treatment arms. Um, within the the study in immunocompromised patients in, with living with HIV infection, um, the age. I, th I would just want to point out the age group included 18 plus. And um, the median age in that study was um, around 40 years of age, so still a little bit on the younger side. But we saw overall very comparable um, uh, safety results then um, for the population um, 50 years of age and older. And with regard to the timing of the injection site events, again, most uh, in solicited events um, occurred within the first five days in where most injection site events occurred within the solicitation period from day one to day five, very few that were reported afterwards. And the solicited systemic events were measured from day one through day 14 in all studies. Great, thank you, Dr. Baker. So um, can you go to the slide where you compare subjects who received PCV13 versus PCV15, specifically the serotype 3 response, which with the Merck uh, PCV15 was superior to the PCV13, uh, just so that slides up. Not the forest plots. Don't you have a plot with... Um, the bar um, chart, I think it's protocol 28, slide 28. So my question is, first, I applaud both companies because uh, we don't have a serolo serologic correlate of protection and functional antibody and killing the bacteria of interest is, of course, um, a great way to think about it. And my question is, so when, when you look at these data, uh, remind us how many subjects are in each of those serotype three bars. In other words, could this superiority or better than non-inferiority statistically be the result of small numbers. Yeah, so, um, and thank you, that, that is a good point. Let me, let me point out this, the study numbers here. So protocol 19 included um, 600 participants per group. So that is the pivotal study that you see here in the middle. Protocol 16 included 650 participants overall, so it's around um, uh, 325 participants per group. Protocol 17 included 1,500 participants that were randomized in the 3 to 1 ratio, um, so there are around 1,100 participants that received V114 and 400 participants that received um, PCV13. Protocol 18, the HIV study was the smallest study with about 300 participants and also 150 per arm. Protocol 20 was also a large study with more than 2,000 participants, um, and there it was also a 3 to 3 to 1 ratio, so um, it was around um, 2,000 participants receiving v 4 and um, 220 participants receiving um, PCV13, and protocol 7 was also a small study with 125 participants per arm. So I think that overall, you know, the numbers um, across these studies are, you know, fairly robust 
um, and you know they include some very large studies, uh, so that you know this is unlikely to be by chance. And as I mentioned, we tested in Protocol 19, um, you know, um, a stringent hypothesis for the serotype three responses as a secondary objective. Well, thank you for the detailed um, answer to my question. And I agree the consistency of the data that you saw on this slide, that's why I wanted to bring it up, that uh, most of the numbers, maybe in HIV, uh, might be too small, but they're robust numbers. But my question is, once you reach 100%, looking at the scale, so the difference between, let's say, uh, 129 in the first bar, 0.5 versus 246, no question there's a substantial difference. Um, I just throw out the comment, and, and you certainly can um, comment back. The comment is, once you reach a certain level of functional antibody, do the differences really mean something? It's a rhetorical question. <laughs> and thank you for your report. Great. Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, I I think, um, and, you know, we touched, I mean, or today, you know, we touched briefly um, on, you know, the mechanisms um, that may underlie the, the different performance of, of pneumococcal vaccines um, against stereotype 3. And, um, you know, some of them are obviously not known, but um, th there is also one thought that, you know, the shedding, for example, of the capsular antigen may play a role. So, you know, in that instance, then it is, um, you know, reasonable to think that higher immune responses, um, uh, you know, could um, be important. Um, you know, to um, overcome that effect of the shedding of the capsule. Thanks so much, Dr. Buckwald. Um, uh, I think we're ready to move on to our next presentation. Uh, Dr. Kobayashi is going to present on considerations um, of both of these vaccines for use in adults. All right. Thank you very much. On behalf of the pneumococcal work group, I will summarize our discussions on considerations for use of PCV15 and PCV20 in U.S. adults. As we presented earlier, from pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, or PCV use in the United States, we learned that introduction of PCV in children has reduced vaccine-preventable pneumococcal disease burden in adults. After PCV-13 was recommended for all adults aged 65 years and older in 2014, reductions in PCV-13-type pneumococcal pneumonia incidence were documented, but no impact on PCV-13-type invasive pneumococcal disease was observed at the population level, despite modest PCV-13 coverage achieved in this population. PCV-13 use in all adults with immunocompromising conditions was recommended in 2012, but PCV-13 coverage in adults aged 65 years and older did not increase until after the age-based recommendation was introduced. As Dr. Paling presented earlier, licensure of PCV-15 and PCV-20 for adults is anticipated this year. Unlike previous conjugate vaccines, the new conjugate vaccines are expected to be licensed for adults before they are licensed for children. Licensure in children is expected to happen one to two years after licensure for adults. In considering use of the new pneumococcal conjugate vaccines in adults, the work group identified the following guiding principles. Decisions on policy options should be supported by best available evidence. Simplifying existing pneumococcal vaccine recommendations could help to improve vaccine coverage among adults. Disparities in pneumococcal disease burden and vaccine coverage should be reduced and timely recommendations for each new vaccine should be made after FDA licensure. This table summarizes current pneumococcal vaccine recommendations for U.S. adults. The recommendations, including the interval of the two vaccine doses, if both PCV13 and PPSV23 are recommended in series, are different by age and risk groups. Currently, all adults aged 65 years or older are recommended either one or both vaccines. To understand which adult groups have the largest vaccine-preventable disease burden, we evaluated the current pneumococcal disease burden in adults 65 years and older. Using ABC's invasive bacterial disease surveillance data and U.S. Census data, we estimated the population and the number of invasive pneumococcal disease cases in all U.S. adults aged 19 years and older. 
there are more than 250 million adults and nearly 30,000 invasive pneumococcal diseases, or IPD cases, and more than 3,000 IPD deaths in a year in adults aged 19 years and older. We then estimated the proportion of adults aged 65 years and older for each category to understand the contribution of adults in this age group to overall adult invasive pneumococcal disease burden. Adults aged 65 years and older comprised 22% of all adults aged 19 years and older. But 40 to 50% of invasive pneumococcal disease cases, including half of the deaths due to invasive pneumococcal disease in adults, were in adults aged 65 years and older. We then looked at adults 50 years and older. This age group comprised 47% of the adult population in the US, and nearly 80% of invasive pneumococcal disease cases and nearly 90% of deaths due to invasive pneumococcal disease in adults were in adults aged 50 years and older. We also looked at the burden of hospitalized pneumococcal pneumonia cases in adults by age group. As you heard earlier, there's a wide range in the estimates of pneumococcal pneumonia incidence across, across studies. So to account for uncertainty, we used two approaches to generate these estimates. Although there were some variations by serotype group, 50% or more of adult vaccine type pneumococcal pneumonia cases were in adults aged 65 years and older and 80% or more of adult vaccine-type pneumococcal pneumonia cases were in adults aged 50 years and older. Next, we evaluated pneumococcal disease burden in adults with underlying conditions that increase their risk of pneumococcal disease in our current indications for pneumococcal vaccine use. This graph shows the invasive pneumococcal disease incidence in 2017 to 2018 in adults aged 19 to 64 years by underlying conditions using ABC's Invasive Pneumococcal Disease Surveillance Data and National Health Interview Survey data. Adults in this age group with chronic medical conditions are currently recommended to receive PPSV23 only. Adults with immunocompromising conditions are recommended to receive both PCV13 and PPSV23 in series. PCV13 introduction in children reduced PCV13 type invasive pneumococcal disease incidence in all groups. However, the relative risk of all invasive pneumococcal disease was four to 40 times higher in adults with underlying conditions compared to those without underlying conditions shown here as healthy. So what proportion of pneumococcal disease cases are in adults with underlying conditions who are at increased risk of pneumococcal disease? Data summarized in this figure are from a retrospective study using data from two U.S. private healthcare claims repositories. At-risk individuals were defined as those who were immunocompetent with one or more chronic medical conditions and high-risk individuals were defined as those who were immunocompromised or had a cochlear implant. In this study, approximately 13% of adults aged 19 to 49 years had underly underlying medical conditions included in current risk-based pneumococcal vaccine recommendations. 52% of pneumococcal pneumonia cases and 46% of invasive pneumococcal disease cases in this age group were in adults with underlying conditions. Approximately 31% of adults aged 50 to 64 years had underlying conditions included in current risk-based pneumococcal vaccine recommendations. And 71% of pneumococcal pneumonia cases and 67% of invasive pneumococcal disease cases in this age group were in adults with underlying conditions. What proportion of invasive pneumococcal disease in adults aged 19 to 64 years with underlying conditions is caused by PCV15 or PCV20 serotypes? In adults aged 19 to 64 years with underlying conditions, the proportion of PCV15 or PCV20 types was relatively smaller compared to adults without underlying conditions. 11 to 13 percent of invasive pneumococcal disease in 2017 to 2018 were due to additional serotypes included in PCV15, but not in PCV13. 
and approximately 27% were due to additional serotypes included in PCV20, but not in PCV13. Of note, the proportion of invasive pneumococcal disease due to non-vaccine types was relatively larger in adults aged 19 to 64 years with underlying conditions compared to adults without conditions. Therefore, use of PCV15 or PCV20 in adults may reduce, but not eliminate, the differences in IPD incidence between those with and without underlying conditions. The black population in the U.S. has had higher pneumococcal disease burden compared to other racial groups. This graph shows all IPD incidence by race from 2007 to 2018. The trends for adults aged 19 to 64 years are to the left, and the trends for adults aged 65 years and older are to the right. Despite the decline in IPD rates in all groups, IPD rates among the black population, shown in blue, have remained higher than for other racial groups. This graph shows the PCV13 type IPD incidence by race from 2007 to 2018. PCV13 type IPD incidence in the black population, shown again in blue, was higher compared to other racial groups before PCV13 introduction in children in 2010. However, the disparities were reduced and nearly eliminated in adults aged 65 years and older after PCV13 introduction. This study used National Health Interview Survey, National Center for Health Statistics and National Inpatient Sample Data, to characterize admissions related to pneumococcal disease, including bacteremia, meningitis, and non-bacteremic pneumonia. The study showed that among adults aged 50 years and older hospitalized with pneumococcal disease, the black population was more likely to be younger than the non-black population. This figure comes from the same study and shows the proportion of individuals with non-immunocompromising conditions that increase the risk of pneumococcal disease by racial group. The proportion in the black population is shown as the black solid line, and the non-black population is shown as the dashed line. With increasing age until around age 75, the proportion of adults with underlying conditions is higher in the black population. We looked at available data to assess whether use of PCV15 or PCV20 in adults would reduce racial disparities in pneumococcal disease burden. We evaluated serotype distribution of invasive pneumococcal disease in 2017 to 2018 by race in adults aged 65 years and older. The proportion of additional serotypes included in PCV15 but not PCV13 types was about 10 to 15 percent by race. And the proportion of additional serotypes in PCV20 but not in PCV13 was around 27 percent for all racial groups. However, the proportion of invasive pneumococcal disease due to non-vaccine types was larger in the black population compared to other racial groups. Similar trends were observed in adults aged 19 to 64 years. Therefore, use of PCV15 or PCV20 in adults may reduce, but not eliminate, racial disparities in invasive pneumococcal disease burden in adults. With these data, the workgroup members are considering the following overarching policy questions for the use of PCV15 or PCV20 in adults. Should PCV15 or PCV20 be routinely recommended in older adults aged 50 or 65 years and older? Should PCV15 or PCV20 be recommended in younger adults with underlying medical conditions? Should we consider the use of PCV15 or PCV20 alone or in series with PPSV23? PICO questions for grade will be presented in future ACIP meetings. For the cost-effectiveness analysis, the workgroup members are considering the following policy options. Option one is to use PCV in all adults aged 65 years and older and have a risk-based recommendation for adults aged 19 to 64 years old. Option two is to use PCV in all adults aged 50 years and older and have a risk-based recommendation for adults aged 19 to 49 years old. 
Given that we have two conjugate vaccines expected to be licensed, we will consider their use alone or in series with PPSV23 as shown here for each of these two options. In today's session, we presented data on the immunogenicity and safety data from phase three studies for PCV15 and PCV20 and on the epidemiology of pneumococcal disease and vaccine preventable disease burden for invasive pneumococcal disease and non-invasive pneumococcal pneumonia. We will continue to review these data on pneumococcal disease burden, including mortality, as additional information becomes available. In future workgroup meetings, the workgroup members will review expected public health impact, including estimated direct effects in adults, impact on health equity, and cost effectiveness of PCV15 or PCV20. Review new evidence on the effectiveness of PPSV23 against pneumococcal disease, and we will use grade and evidence recommendations framework to summarize the evidence. At the next ACIP meeting, we plan to present findings from the cost effectiveness analysis and public health impact, ETR, and GREAT. I'd like to acknowledge the following groups and individuals. And I'll ha on behalf of the work group, thank you for your attention. And with Dr. Romero's permission, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you so much. Um, uh, do, do we have any questions or comments from ACIP members, Dr. Lee? <laughs> thank you. I just wanted to say that was um, a phenomenal set of presentations overall. Thank you so much. Um, I, I do want to endorse the idea of the questions that you had put up about uh, what are the potential policy options to be considered. Um, I, I know from our prior conversations that in particular, uh, the order of the vaccines may make a difference. And so priming with the conjugate vaccine for those who have not previously seen pneumococcal vaccines would be important. So I really like that idea. Um, and also we'll just throw in the added question, which won't impact this decision right now, but in the future may be helpful with regard to the younger cohorts that are now aging into the 19 year old, 20 year old population who have received PCV7 and now PCV13. So um, it'll be interesting to understand what the potential impact is and agree that modeling is gonna be necessary, uh, particularly with regard to the question of uh, with or without uh, the polysaccharide vaccine to extend the number of serotypes covered. Think, uh, and one last thing, sorry. I just also wanted to uh, uh, call out that I do think it's really interesting that 15 and 20, the PCV15 and 20 um, you know, perhaps have different characteristics that provide different differential advantages. Um, so with the serotype three, and then also just uh, really appreciate again, uh, enrolling diverse populations like the American Indian population, which we know um, has also suffered a disproportionate share of the burden of pneumococcal disease. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Do we have any other questions or comments from ACIP members? I'll open it up to liaisons ex officios. Uh, Dr. Goldman. Thank you so much. Um, you know, one of the considerations I look at, and I know it's always difficult for the committee to do comparative effectiveness and try to do a preference of one vaccine over another, um, but I do think that from the community standpoint, they may look at it as a higher number is better and just naturally gravitate towards one vaccine over another, depending on which is approved. Uh, so messaging and data based on whatever final decision comes out is going to be important if we look at preference of one vaccine or if both licensed products do get approval and how they're used uh, to really make it clear if they are one better than another or if they can be used interchangeably. But I also am really curious and interested to see long term how we look at age based as far as racial disparities, because if you look at life expectancy of some of the minorities and people of color may not be reaching the older age groups to even get the benefit of the vaccine. So simplifying it with the age based recommendation might have a substantial impact on life expectancy and be really interesting to see that data long term, as well as, of course, simplifying the recommendations will make the adult vaccination program just so much easier. So a lot of information I think we need moving forward, uh, but 
I do think the perspective of the community physician is going to gravitate towards one vaccine over another, depending on what's approved. Over. Thank you, Dr. Goldman, for those comments. Great. Um, well, it looks like those are all the hands up, so we will uh, break for uh, quote unquote lunch. Um, it is 12 uh, 11. Let's uh, return um, uh, at 12 30 for the next session. Thank you.